Hello guys, I wasn't able to come in today. I'm feeling better, but not good enough to be in front of you. I don't want to get any of you guys sick. Um, this is a video I made about passive transport. Um, passive transport is how cells move substances in and out without using any energy. That's what makes it passive, that the cell is not using any energy. Uh, the most common forms of passive transport are diffusion and osmosis. Um, so this is a slide showing one example of diffusion. If you take a lump of sugar and you dump into a glass of water, over time that water is going to diffuse throughout the throughout the water. And you have a sugar water spread out. You notice how there's no sugar inside at first. Um, you drop the sugar in. As soon as the sugar is here, there's an area of high concentration sugar where that cube was first dropped in. And there's a low concentration of sugar over here on this end. There's like one, two, three sugar molecules here. But over here, there's like you know, 20, 30 sugar molecules. It's more likely that one of these 20 molecules will go up to the right than it is that one of these three molecules will go down to the left. Over time, these molecules bounce around inside of here like little balls in a Chuck E. Cheese pit, and they get all spread out evenly. Now, now in this situation here, there's these four balls in the top right corner, and there's these four balls down here in the bottom left. It's equally likely that these four in the bottom left will move up, and these four in the top right will move down, because there's the same distribution inside there. This solution is said to be e equilibrium. And the sugar molecules are still going to move around the water because they just move randomly around inside there. Um, but they're, they're no longer going to have a net motion. Like they, they moved from one corner to the other when they were diffusing. I place one drop of food coloring into the petri dish full of water. This is to show diffusion in action. With diffusion, the particles of food coloring move from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration over time. In the beaker to the left is hot tap water, and the beaker on the right is cold tap water. You can see how temperature affects the rate of diffusion. With higher temperatures, the rate of diffusion is higher, and lower temperatures, the rate of diffusion is lower. So we said that diffusion is the motion of molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Um, and then the molecules are going to move both ways. They're going to, but more molecules are going to move from a high concentration to a low because there are more molecules to move that way. Um, then we'll move from low to high. Um, and then we saw how temperature had an effect on the speed of diffusion. Warmer things are going to dis, dis, um, diffuse faster because those molecules are moving faster. Um, here we can see um, simple diffusion across the membrane. Here we have. Uh, here's a membrane inside here. There's all these molecules. They start to move across. Now, in this situation, there are no molecules on the right here to move across uh, to the left. So all the diffusion is going to have to be to the right. But once we get here, now there are molecules that can move to the right, and there are some molecules that can move to the left. But there are more molecules that can move to the right than there are molecules that can move to the left. So we'd expect more molecules as a whole to move to the right. And that's what happens here. And then we get here, there's an equal number of molecules on both right and left. This is at equilibrium. The molecules are going to continue to move across from left to right. Now, by the way, note, how do these molecules get across? They go through those little holes inside there. Here we have a diffusion of two solutes. We have these purple dots and these um, orange dots. Now, the orange dots can only move to the left because there are none on the on the left to begin with. And the purple dots can only move to the right because there are none on the right to begin with. And look at that, that's what happens. Now, this orange dot could move to the back to the right. Um, and there are also one, two, three, four, five orange dots that could move to the left. And that's so it's more likely that orange dots are going to keep on moving to the left uh, as a whole. Or I could get maybe three of them move to the left and this one moves back. I don't know. But eventually what's going to happen is we're going to get an equal number of purple uh, dots on the left and right and an equal number of orange dots on the left and right. Um, note how here each solute, the, the orange and the purple, each solute had its own concentration to start with and they, eat, they both reach equilibrium independent of each other. Right? It's not um, the number of purple dots doesn't have any effect on the number of orange dots moving back and forth. They're, equal, they're independent.
Okay, so we've been talking about uh, diffusion and things getting into or out of a cell across its membrane. Uh, but what's, what about osmosis, movement of water? Now, cells typically want water to get in and out. It's just fine. It goes through little pores like anything else would. Um, but it needs to treat water a little bit differently because it is so abundant. It's the solvent, after all, not the solute. Uh, here, this is a, um, an image. It's actually a video. I'll play it in a little bit. Uh, these are red blood cells. I know they don't look red, whatever. These are red blood cells that they're in water, and they're not, so water, they're not in any solution, um, like blood, they're in water, so these are in a situation where there's, the concentration of water is higher outside than it is inside, this is pure water on the outside, 100% water, so the water in the situation, there's more water outside of the cell than there is inside of the cell, uh, so there's more likely that water will move in than it will move out, and we're going to see what happens to them um, as they go around. Watch this guy here in particular, followed shortly by this guy here. But you hear that they're all getting, oh, boom, he blows up, and that one blows up, right? They explode, right? Too much water, boom, that guy blew up. Sorry, I got a little excited there at the hypertonic explosion of red blood cells. Uh, so that was osmosis, and what goes on with osmosis that you have, um, water moving in and out of cells happens all the time, usually does not result in death of the cell. It showed an extreme example there. But when, when water is passively transported, um, that's when you have osmosis. And you're just going to have water molecules on both sides, but if there's more on the outside than the inside, they'll pass right through. Um, there, this is a terrible diagram, by the way. They're not just going to go through the lipid membrane. They would never get through the hydrophobic parts there. There'd need to be some kind of um, aquapore or a, a channel there. I'll show you a better example later. Um, there's a couple situations when we, when we refer to cells and osmosis. If the concentration of water outside is higher than the concentration of water inside the cell, then that's said to be hypotonic, right? There's more water outside um, the, the cell than there is inside. That's hypotonic. I call it hypotonic because the cell is going to behave like a hippo and just swell up real big, right? Hypotonic or hypotonic um, conditions. The cell is going to get bigger if there's more water outside than inside because more water is going to come in. If there's more water um, inside the cell than outside, uh, that's called hypertonic. So there's there's more water in the cell than there are higher concentration of water inside the cell than outside. Um, water's going to leave. So think of it this way, maybe. If the cell was a was filled with Gatorade and you put that cell into uh, some water, well, water's going to, uh, if the cell is full of water and you put in the Gatorade, uh, then you're going to have water leave the cell. Um, go out. That's called hypertonic. The cell is going to shrink. So I showed you a video there of some red blood cells exploding. They were in a hypotonic environment. They were getting bigger and bigger and bigger because there was more water outside than inside and they just eventually took in more water than they could hold and they exploded. Hypotonic environments are very dangerous for animal cells because we don't have a cell wall that holds us together. Hypertonic environments are less of a problem for us. They're not great. When you're dehydrated, you're in a hypertonic environment, um, but they're they're not as deadly as fast as a hypotonic environment is. Um, but plant cells are going to have a, a very hard time with hypertonic environments. We'll talk about those later. Uh, the last option, of course, is that you could have the same concentration of water inside and outside of the cell. You go to great effort in your body to maintain this condition. It's called isotonic where you have the same amount, same concentration of water outside as inside um, all of your cells. Your kidneys uh, work very hard to maintain this isotonic water concentration level inside your body. Okay, earlier I alluded to that a terrible model of how water got in. There needs to be a membrane protein to allow any substance to get across that lipid bilayer. As you can see here, we have an integral protein. It's closed. They call that a, when they, a, a, a protein that can open and close. It's called a gated channel. And the part that opens and closes is called the gate. So and this is a channel. So this gate would open and something would go through it. 
So here the gate is open and sodium ions are going right through it. Yay! Um, another way that things get through are called carrier proteins. This is a large protein that kind of changes shape, much like a, a turning door would change shape. If, you, if you're going into like a hotel lobby or a building lobby, uh, something like that, you turn the door. The door turns, um, the door spins, but you provide the energy for that spinning, right? It doesn't spin itself because all this is passive transport. Um, the cell is using no energy at all. But the cell can choose whether to open or close the gate. Um, so whether a molecule is entering in through a carrier protein, like a turning turnstile kind of door that changes shape as it goes, lets things in and out, or it's going through a channel, which is, is a narrow opening that lets things through, the cell is using no energy to do that. But the cell can control whether the carrier protein or the ion channel functions at all by just closing it or opening it. Um, it's also worth noting here that for every substance that enters the cell, uh, there is a membrane protein that, that controls its access. Um, another way of saying that is a substance can only go through one kind of channel. So this is a sodium ion channel. It only lets sodium ions in. This, I believe, is a carrier protein to let glucose come in and these are glucose molecules entering the cell um, and if you wanted to get something else like chlorine in uh, you're gonna have to get a chlorine ion channel to let that chlorine go out there isn't one here so any chlorine that's inside the cell is gonna stay in any chlorine that's outside is gonna have to stay out there's no ion channel it's another way a cell can control what gets in and out is just not have an, an opening for it but there's a specific protein for every substance that's going to get transported across the cell membrane, including water. The water goes across something called an aquaporin, which looks a lot like an ion channel here. It just flows right through. Here's an interesting video about um, channels, ion channels in particular, but any kind of channel would work this way, and what controls whether they're open or closed. Now we are going to be looking a little bit more at the at the uh, nervous system, and this is an example using some nervous system uh, words inside of here. But just how a, a an ion channel would work, or any kind of channel could be controlled by a cell. There are a number of ways that ion channels can open up in the cell membrane. Here are two ways that are really important when understanding how a neuron sends signals to other neurons. The first one here is a chemical gated ion channel and it has a receptor site for a chemical. Now that chemical can come in and let's say a neurotransmitter and fit in the receptor. This will cause the receptor to open up kind of like a key into a lock. Okay, so this chemical gated ion channel He's used a neurotransmitter as an example here in a nerve cell, but another example would be um, insulin. If you want sugar to get into the cell, you need insulin to attach to this uh, to the, this channel that will open the channel that will let sugar come in. If you don't have insulin, then you will your cell will not let the sugar in. Insulin is the trigger that opens up this channel that allows glucose to enter the cell. So it works the same way. Sodium can come rushing in and may affect another type of ion channel, but this is voltage gated. When the voltage around this ion channel gets to a threshold, a very specific level, then it too can open up and ions can come rushing in. Uh, sorry, I, I cut him off there pretty abruptly with the voltage gated channel, but the idea that there can be an electrical signal that opens and controls whether an ion channel is open. Um, so our, this video has been about homeostasis and transport, it's specifically passive transport in cells. It's not about how a cell drives from point A to point B, um, but it's how cells control how substances get in and out. It has a lot to do with shape, the same way that a dolphin moves differently than a cow. The way that cells get things in and out has to do with the shapes of the proteins in their cell membranes. Hope you found this useful, guys. And I hope to see you tomorrow in school.